Today we're at Compass Baron Quarry. Uh, we're doing some uh, training, doing topographic surveys and ortho mosaics uh, with uh, Construction Drone Services, which is uh, Ian, Chris and myself, Dave. And uh, we all represent different drone companies. Uh, this is a collaborative effort that we're doing, uh, combining our skills in uh, different parts of the kind of workflow in producing uh, ortho mosaics. Uh, so today, uh, we're out doing uh, just a practice run uh, using a new base station and doing some workflow uh, workflow efficiency improvement, I guess, uh, using these ground control points, uh, the Inspire 2, and I believe we're using PIX4D for mission planning today to create the ortho mosaic uh, of this quarry face behind us. Uh, we'll also uh, be doing some uh, processing of the imagery afterwards and uh, looking at uh, the kind of relative accuracies we're achieving, uh, doing some actual physical measurements of uh, targets on the ground to see how they uh, look and compare uh, in the actual software afterwards versus uh, what we've ground truthed on the ground. The first part of planning an aerial survey, we follow a set of steps that we have in an operations manual. Uh, the first part is usually looking for any nearby air hazards such as airports, uh, and other restricted areas such as uh, power stations, prisons, that sort of thing. Should we find we do have an airport in a vicinity, it doesn't necessarily mean that we can't undertake a drone operation, it just means that there's a little bit more uh, work involved in getting permissions from the airport and working with them uh, to see if we can authorise a safe flight. Once we have determined that there aren't any immediate risks uh, in air traffic, we would then do an on-site survey and look at uh, areas such as local habitation, local properties, farms, any other hazards that may be a problem. Our next step would be to program an automated mission using a software such as PIX4D Capture or Drone Deploy. This would just make sure that we had the right number of photos taken at the correct interval to ensure that there's a correct overlap to perform photogrammetry. On site, we would proceed to set up a series of ground control points around the site. There would typically be five to 10 of these scattered around the area, which we would be uh, doing the survey of. Uh, the idea of these is that they would give a fixed point in the ground which we could correlate with the images we were taking uh, to georeference the photography correctly. Uh, these would be uh, taken using survey uh, equipment so there'd be a, in this case here we're using uh, a base station and a survey pole and using uh, a post-processing method to achieve this. Uh, we then go about uh, setting up the mission and the drone hardware to undertake the mission. In this case we're using PIX4D Capture, so we then proceed to power everything up and push that mission to the drone uh, ready for an automated flight. Using this automated software, the drone would have a series of waypoints loaded up and it would proceed to perform the mission automatically and capture a number of photographs at a set position and height. Uh, as part of our CAA PFCO, we still have to have manual control over it should there be any sort of aircraft incursion and uh, also as part of that we have a competent observer which would be accompanying the pilot in case of any sort of air space infringement. After the mission is complete the drone would return to its set home point and automatically land. After the mission is complete we would then remove all our gear from the site and take the imagery off-site to post-process. Back at the office we've now downloaded the log files from the base and rover station and processed them using a software called RTKLib. This is used in conjunction with correction observations from a local uh, base station. In the UK these are usually run by uh, the Ordnance Survey 
uh, and they provide Rhinex files uh, with atmospheric correction information which we use in conjunction with our own to derive a more accurate uh, position. Moving on to the photogrammetry operation with PIX4D Mapper. Uh, I've already run this project but in the case we have here uh, I'll just chat about it from the start. Once we have imported all our photography into PIX4D, it gives us this overview uh, whereby it's downloaded the geotags uh, from each photograph taken from the drone and this shows a good example of verifying the flight path is what we would have expected it to be. Uh, here we see a, a more defined cluster where uh, Chris who was flying this day uh, flew manually to get oblique images of the quarry face to improve the 3D model. Now this would typically run for a couple of hours and the results would be the point cloud and various other uh, derivatives that we'd get from the photogrammetry operation in PIX4D. So here again is a quick verification. Uh, in this case we're using a, a multi-rotor so we expect all the images to be looking straight down because it has a gimbal. In some cases, uh, doing larger map mapping operations with a fixed wing, these might well be tilted a little bit to the right or the left, depending on which direction the aircraft is flying to the wind. Uh, that would typically be for a, a fixed wing uh, drone that looks like a, a miniature aeroplane. So if I remove the cameras, we can get a, a better look at the point cloud. This would be typically something similar to what you would see with LiDAR. In the case of LiDAR, each of these points would be a single laser bounce uh, between the aircraft sensor and the ground. But in the case of photogrammetry, what we see here is each of these points is actually a matching key point between two photographs taken uh, from the drone. And uh, this is in essence how photogrammetry uh, works in building up 3D information by comparing uh, two points in images which have a set position apart and we also have technical information on the camera such as its focal length uh, to get some sort of bearing on the, the distance that the, the camera is from an object. PIX4D comes with a handy little module where we can classify our point cloud. This is a big advantage when it comes to uh, making an actual contour map because things like here like trees uh, we would call the actual uh, terrain model such as high grass and trees and we're not necessarily interested in that we want to look at the surface so PIX4D has this kind of module to uh, be able to remove some of these points in the point cloud to give us as clean a contour map as possible. Finally one thing I thought I would uh, show here is that for 3D modelling, PIX4D can combine all this uh, information from the depth of the point cloud uh, points and also the, the images taken from the camera to make a 3D mesh. Uh, these type of things uh, can be a, of interest to kind of a variety of stakeholders. Uh, we've had quite a few inquiries of people uh, wanting to look at positions where they might build a house or property and wanted to, a kind of 3D a model to kind of view the area where their future home might sit or a building for that matter but the, the pos possibilities of this are endless. With uh, a model like this once it's imported into a, a 3D games engine uh, such as Unity with a model like this a model like this can typically be imported into a 3D software or a games engine where you can have a small character rig which would be able to, you would give you a, a point of view perspective from within the model which you could walk around with, with say virtual reality specs or some other type of viewer. So one of the ways that so 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 one of the outputs that we were looking for in this project was our topographical map. Pix4D is primarily 
processing software. It doesn't have a great amount of tools for visualization or for measurement. When Pix4D completes, depending on what our processing objectives were, it can output a number of files, such as our uh, digital surface model, terrain models, and one thing we're looking for here was contours. So we can now go and take a look at that. Here we see the hillside behind the quarry face and the steeper contours as the quarry face and the, the scree slope slope down into the quarry. This was a quick demonstration of a relatively small area, but in the future we'll be adding to this series uh, looking at much larger models over several square miles.